vascular training is actually a lot of fun. We're going to get very much in depth on HD base T and a lot of technologies that look like HD base T. If you have a question, you'll have plenty of time. Well, plenty of time for questions at the end. Feel free if your question pertains to that particular slide or something like that, just go ahead and shout it out, okay? So you're not gonna interrupt me if you ask questions. Um, and we will have questions also from the people who are on our webinar. If you have to have, if you have a question and you're on the webinar, use that chat feature and Kayla will be more than happy to interject that question into what we're doing. So let's get started. What we're going to talk about today, a little bit about defining digital video. You know, we talk about moving digital video longer lengths. And we have some real limitations here. Because if you look at things like DisplayPort, 10 meters at best. I mean, guys, 10 meters, we can, we can barely get out of the rack with 10 meters. HDMI, 20 meters. There's, there's nobody here that would run an HDMI cable more than about 50 or 60 feet without electronics, right? That's a surefire way to get yourself in some hot water. So we've got about 20. So what do we have to do if we have to go more than that 50 or 60 feet that these signals naturally propagate? We have to understand what the payload is, and that's going to be the first part of this training, is talking about that digital payload. And then we're going to talk about the various techniques we, that we use for long distance point-to-point -point connections, and we'll dissect the various options and entertain questions and thoughts about how we're going to use them. So let's get started. I kind of I kind of like this quote. I think it's important for us right now. I sense an insatiable demand for connectivity. Let's talk about that last 100 meters, right? The 100 meters generally between the equipment, between the network drop, between the rack, and between the human being. So first we have to understand this. In the analog days, analog is really kind of unique. And we may have forgotten some of this because it's been a while, but did you know that analog has unlimited resolution? The difference is analog's unlimited resolution comes with an extremely expensive noise floor problem. And if you think back, how long have we known about this? How long have we manipulated this? Let's take a step all the way back to the 1970s. How many of you remember quadraphonic? I see a few people who might have been around here long enough. Remember. You remember how they did quadraphonic on an LP? Well, the way they did that, right now, keep in mind, this is a moving stylus in a plastic vinyl groove rotating at 33 and a third RPMs. And the way that the engineers decided to get the rear channel sounds when they put that together was they multiplexed the rear channel sounds from 20 kilohertz to 40 kilohertz. We just went double in frequency on a record. And then when we played it back, we simply multiplexed those back down into the audible bandwidth because as long as we could comb that information through the noise floor, we could recover it. The digital world actually does something rather unique. It exchanges resolution for noise floor. Kind of the opposite of the way we think. We think of digital as high resolution. And when we look at what's happening inside the cable, Analog really does follow some simple rules. It's continuous in nature. It never stops. We can slice it smaller and smaller. It has that infinite bandwidth, but it has all these problems of additive noise and generative noise. And if you look on the screen right there, you're going to see the sine wave. Everything in electronics starts with the sine wave, right? The motion of the ocean. That's what a sine wave is. And if we look at the ones and zeros that are in a digital system, that's really represented by a square wave. Do you know how we get to a square wave from a sine wave? We take the base sine wave. Let's say that that sine wave at the very top is 100 hertz, 100 cycles per second. To make that into a square wave, we add all of its odd harmonics ad infinitum. So we add 300 hertz, 500 hertz, 700 hertz, 900, 1100, 1300, 1500, and on and on and on at progressively lower volumes. So to get to this square wave, we have added unimaginable amounts of high frequency. And what's the hardest thing to get through, through, through a piece of wire? High frequency. Ask any radio or broadcast engineer, and that's where we struggle. The advantage of a digital signal is it uses discrete representations of information. We all know this, right? That the way digital works is it samples the system. It takes a photograph at a set point in time, known as the sampling rate. By the way, just to put it in a perspective, the sampling frequency for a compact disc is what? Audio. Say it again. 44.1 kilohertz, 44,100 times a second we take a picture of audio. How fast do we sample digital video, high def? 74.25 megahertz. 
So it's a much, much higher frequency of sampling that we're taking these pictures. And then of course, when we do this, we're taking this picture. Anything that happened between the pictures we're taking, between the samples we're taking, is lost forever. Hence, digital systems have a finite resolution. In other words, we can't get any better resolution than the system was designed for. This was really imparted to us by a fellow by the name of Claude Shannon, who wrote a book called On Information Technology in 1948. And this book was classified information by the US government until the 1950s. Of course, you can read it now. It's commonly part of the, the, the digital digital training for engineers. If you do decide that you want to read this and step into the uh, past history of digital, I do want to warn you though, it is so amazingly dull <laughs> that the only way, well here's how I got through it. Two Red Bulls and a bottle of vodka and I got through the first chapter. And just repeat that until you either go insane or you've read the whole thing. So it's a lot of fun. But what we do is a binary system, right? We've decided in digital, randomly, it doesn't have to be a binary system, but we've decided it's going to be a binary system based on two, a one or a zero, an on or an off, uh, this or that. And any time you add another bit, you double the amount of information. So if I have a two-bit system, then I have four pieces of information. If I add another bit, we're going to double that information to eight possible capabilities. Anytime we disturb something in this digital system, it really doesn't matter until it gets to the point where we can't tell a one from a zero and then the system fails. But in the analog world, we could have ghosts, we could have sparkles, we could have noise, we could regenerate signals, we could use brute force tactics and just throw an amplifier on there. You can't do that in the digital world. So here's a question and you're seeing kind of really the, the answer already on the screen. HDMI cable going to this projector. What's flowing through it? A digital signal or an analog signal? Anybody? It's analog. It's analog because you can't get ones and zeros to flow into a projector. It can represent the ones and zeros that go to a fixed pixel display, but all of the things that are going through the wire are in fact analog signals. And the way that it works is, you can see right here, we have an example of an eye pattern. There's a detector, and it sees that the voltage goes high, and it says, well, that's a one, and it sees that the voltage goes low, and it says that's a zero, or however we want to label these things. But you can also see that this has the shape of an eye. And when we talk about jitter, it means that these sampling points move in time, and if they impinge upon that eye, then the sample collapses and it does not work. This is why in the early days of HDMI, weren't those fun days? Anybody remember 2005 and every one of us in this room going, HDMI is never going to be part of commercial video. That's not happening. No. And then in 2008, you're going, no, this is definitely not happening. 2010, you were like, listen, man, I told you five years ago, this ain't happening. It is now the only way we make connections is utilizing this. And what HDMI did, what DVI did, what DisplayPort did, what USB did is they said, there's no length limitation on the cable as long as you can get that eye pattern to come back to where it can be recognized. But they didn't tell us how to do that. You can go and explore another planet as long as you can build a rocket ship that will get you there. We're not gonna stop you, essentially is what they said. So we utilize clock signals to tell us when this is going to start and stop, and hence we get this concept of jitter. Now we use two axes to be able to measure these things. We measure them at the clock speed, and we also measure them at the bit depth. And when this is going through wire, this fellow, George Simon Ohm, who came out of the middle of the 19th century, his stuff is really important. Everybody remember this from your first years in, in, uh, in, in engineering school or your first years when you started getting into this? Remember how to use this, right? If I want to find out what the value of the resistance is, just cover it and I find out that it's the voltage divided by the current and vice versa. This still comes in super handy because all of Ohm's laws really do matter when we get down to sending a digital signal through the wire. The longer the piece of wire we're going to send it through, the greater the resistance, the greater the impedance of the wire, the greater the reactance, the greater the capacitance. And this is really a physical attribute of the cross-sectional area of the wires. So if you want to have an HDMI cable capable of supporting 4K video and going 30 meters, it would be a wonderful piece of gear to install. It would be as flexible as rebar. It would be about three quarters of an inch in diameter. It would cost you about $800 a foot and you wouldn't be able to terminate it or even get it to the job site unless you had a, a, a fork truck. 
So we really have to look at this. This does give us the physical limitations of where we can be. And whenever we look at this, we have a frequency drop. So if we have pure resistance, everything drops the same way. But we have something even more important. The capacitance and the inductance act like the tone controls on that quadraphonic stereo. More capacitance, I'm turning down the treble control. More inductance, I'm turning down the bass control. How can you control capacitance and inductance in the connections that you're putting behind the walls? You can't. This is a physical attribute of the cable. Does the manufacturer of the cable give you all that information to make a good choice? They can't because they're building to certain specifications. So it requires really that you sit back and look at the entire industry to figure out exactly how these things are going to work. Now, characteristic impedance is very important. We have anybody here who's been in broadcast in the past, radio, television, broadcast? Remember. Even at your house, you have cable television, right? Probably have cable television coming into your house. What kind of a cable is that coming in on? Coaxial, coaxial cable. What else do we call a coaxial cable? Anybody ever hear of it referred to as a 75 ohm cable? How do we get to that 75 ohms? You ever wonder that? You ever put a volt ohm meter on there and see if you can measure it? But if you measure from one end to the other, you get a dead short. If you measure between the shield and the center, well, that's an open circuit. You have no connectivity. Where's the 75 ohms come from? And that's this characteristic impedance. By the way, HDMI cables, DVI cables, display port cables, USB cables, category cables, they all have characteristic impedance that we have to worry about, particularly as manufacturers, making sure we're building stuff that you can use. It is the opposition in a circuit to the flow of electrons, and it manifests itself as frequency-dependent resistance. So it manifests itself as these little tone controls we have to deal with, and more importantly, it manifests itself as somewhat like a partially silvered mirror. So if I have this 75 ohm coaxial cable and I'm doing a cable installation setup and I go into a port that's not 75 ohms, what happens is that acts like a one-way mirror and part of that signal is reflected all the way back to the beginning where it mixes out of phase and causes even more problems. So characteristic impedance is one of the things we have to think about when we start looking at how are we going to extend digital video cables longer than 100 meters. And it's determined by the physical characteristics of the wire that we're putting in place. We have to make sure that we understand the characteristic impedance requirements of our network. And this is nothing less than network technology that we're talking about. Here's another one, and I love this one. This was actually something that was explored by, of all companies, Monster Cable over a number of years in talking about high-end speaker wire, where incidentally physics tells me that that was a wonderful marketing story but probably didn't hold a lot of water when it came to a physical uh, analysis. Have you heard of skin effect? Anybody heard of this? So here's what happens. When we go to really, really high frequencies, what happens inside, if this was all copper, if this large circle was all copper, what happens is the frequencies get higher and higher, they create a back EMF, they create a counter force that makes them want to move out to the outside edge of that cable. Now why is that important? Well, if we're doing digital video at 1920 by 1080, we're talking about a 74.25 megahertz sampling rate. Each sample is going to be 8 bits converted to 10 bits. We're going to have a huge amount of information, an incredible amount of information. It could be over 10 gigabits per second that's coming through a cable to make this happen. And that frequency wants to naturally migrate out to the outer edge of the copper. If you've ever been to a broadcast facility and really looked at the wire, and I'm going to use the word wire because it's really not, it's more like a pipe, that goes to the top of the, brand, the transmitting tower, it's hollow. We don't need all the copper in the middle. We just need the stuff on the outside. We call it at that point a waveguide. Have you ever thought about this as being important in our business? Putting aside the speaker cables and the audiophile sensibilities, and by the way, I'm definitely in the audiophile camp. Make mine vacuum tubes and horns, please, and I still listen to vinyl because every now and then I just want it to be simple. But have you ever thought about skin effect for digital video? Well, it's very, very important, especially as we start moving our cables over category cable, or moving our signals over category cable. Because category cables can come in two versions. You can get a, a, a stranded category cable, nice and flexible, and much more dependable, because it's not going to break if it's been moved back and forth a few times. Or you can get solid core, which is what we use for fixed wiring behind the walls, 
Even your jumper cable should be solid core when we're dealing with digital video because the skin effect is very real when we start talking about these very high frequencies. And folks, when we get into 4K, this stuff gets really crazy. And we're gonna talk a little bit about 4K right now, right? We're gonna talk about the digital payload because it's not enough for me to say, I wanna run digital video to this projector. There's a lot more going on than just digital video. And for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations. Nature cannot be fooled. Richard Feynman, of course, the Nobel laureate, the fellow who figured out exactly what caused the space shuttle Columbia to, uh, to explode on launch. I believe it was the Columbia with the O-rings that had the, the issue. Very, very brilliant fellow. So what are we sending over a signal? What are we sending for digital video? Well, first and foremost, our color system that we use in all video worldwide, there's no more systems that are different, right? We've abandoned PAL and CCAM and all these other things. Digital video now has country codes. It's a firmware release, right? It's really not changing things. But when we look at it, this signal consists of additive red, green, and blue. I say RG, RGB, you immediately recognize red, green, and blue. If I take all of those colors and add them in the right proportions, roughly about 60% of it is green, about 20% of it is red, about 10% of it is blue. When we see that, we see white. And every single color that we see in video, all 16.77 million of them, or a combination of these three colors. And if we get into, and you're gonna love this one, I was recently reading an article about Super MHL's new connectivity standards and capabilities that support 8K video at 48-bit color depth. I have no idea what aliens they are projecting this to because this is far beyond what the human eye can see. But by golly, we will have that connector and you'll be expected to install it probably from an iPad wirelessly inside of the next two years. <laughs> Somebody's gonna do this, I'm telling you. So you heard it here first, be prepared by aspirin. Oh, by the way, before I go any farther, I do wanna ask, well actually I'm gonna give you an answer and you can tell me the question at the end of this. The answer is two. Okay, keep that in mind. The answer is two, and we'll get back to that question. So, when we look at this, also keep in mind that when we're talking about red, green, and blue, the amplitude, how loud the red is, how loud the green is, how loud the blue is, that tells us what the color saturation is. So we're really dealing with technology that looks an awful lot like AM radio. In fact, most of what we've done here is based on ADM, AM radio technology. So, don't even bother with this eye chart. Let me tell you how this works. Chroma decimation, chroma subsampling. Guys, this one will catch you by surprise if you're not careful, and it works like this, okay? As we evolved as a species, as we're out on the Serengeti, it was not important from a nature point of view for us to know the color of the tiger that was going to eat us. It was enough that we understood tiger, gonna eat us, better run like hell and find a tree. This is how we survive. So our eyes don't see color the same way they see black and white. Did you know that? In 1953, when we created color television under the NTSC, we utilized a chroma subcarrier. We actually had half the resolution in color that you have in black and white. And every TV program you've watched for your entire life, you've never seen the same amount of color information as black and white information on broadcast. But there are devices that don't do that. We call them computers. They output full RGB color space and don't do this chroma subsampling. There's a couple of numbers that you will see. Occasionally you'll see a number that says content is going to be 444. This means that it is full bandwidth red, full bandwidth green, full bandwidth blue. You may see something that is 4444. What's that? We added an alpha channel, a transparency channel for the graphics so my computer can overlay and do markups. And this is very important if you're doing any kind of live presentation support. But everything you've ever watched, broadcast, DVDs, Blu-rays, 480p, VHS videotape, Betamax, it doesn't matter, that's 420. I'm not gonna get into how we get to these different color um, levels, but I just wanna kinda point this out. Four plus four plus four is 12. 12 is maximum bandwidth. I'm filling the pipe with all kinds of signal. If I use a 420, four plus two plus zero is six. Six is half of 12, 420 is half the bandwidth of RGB. 422 is 33% less the bandwidth. And if you're installing systems that are doing sophisticated digital video switching and operating, for instance, 
in HD base T, and we'll be getting to that in a minute, you have to ask yourself that question. Is the backplane of that device designed for 420 or 444? <coughs> that information is available, but we're not having that conversation as quickly as we should. Because it's fine for me to have 420 in my home theater where I'm going to watch even the most sophisticated streaming video and I want to have the highest resolution. This doesn't affect how nice the picture quality is, but the minute I come in with a digital SLR or come in with a computer graphics card from my computer and plug that in, I'm now at 444 and I could have double the bandwidth on the same link. If you're working, for instance, in a university environment, that's an important question to answer. And this slide really does give us a little bit of that idea of how we manage to mathematically make this whole thing work and save it. We don't really need to worry. This is, this is embedded into the content. So we really don't need to worry about it, but it's important that you have the background and that you have the comfort to at least have the conversation and say, okay, Mr. Customer, you've asked me to create a conference room like the one we're standing in and we're putting in a projector. What is your source? I realize there are competitive bids saying they can do this, that, and the other thing, and they can use an inexpensive cable, or perhaps they can use a cable with an active chipset, perhaps like a Redmere style chipset. We make these as well at Legrand, and that's they're fantastic products, but they bind, they are the boundary of resolution because they're the boundary of our payload characteristics. They're not going to let us do 444, and your system will be a little bit flaky if we don't have this question and this understanding of chroma decimation and how it affects bandwidth. Now, if we're sending digital video, we also have to send audio because this is an AV industry. It's not just a V industry. By the way, when I started, it was just A. We hadn't gotten to V yet. So I was, a, I was an A person. And now we're into AV, and I think next up is going to be an AVC as we move to this, okay? So digital audio is part of the payload. Where does digital audio exist inside of digital video? If I took, has anybody taken an HDMI cable and carefully dissected it and looked inside to see the 19 different conductors and figure out what they do? Has anybody, let's take a different, has anybody out of just sheer frustration gnawed through an HDMI cable <laughs> in the hopes that the damn thing would work? Well, inside of it, you are not going to find wires that are carrying audio. In fact, in the digital world, the idea of us sending audio over 3.5 millimeter and digital video over a DVI connector, it really doesn't work that well. You have two separate switching paths and two separate sets of latencies, which can really be an issue. In fact, what they did is this. Claude Shannon, in that book on information theory, said all bits are fungible. As long as the operating system can basically figure out what to do with the one or zero, it doesn't matter how the one or zero got there. They're all the same stuff. So we take digital audio and we stuff it into digital video. We have red, green, blue, and inside of that, which by the way, we use this 8B, 10B conversion. I may be talking about that in a second. We have a little bit of extra room called the horizontal ancillary channel, and that's why we need to utilize an audio D embedder in order to recover audio from these signals. Something else that you need to look at. Well, if we're going to have digital audio and digital video, you know the problem with digital video is that it doesn't copy. There are no copies in digital video. In the analog world, if I had a videotape and I put it into a VCR and I made a copy, I could hand you a copy of that tape and you might think to yourself, thank you, that was very kind. I'm not gonna watch it very often because the quality kind of sucks because this thing really it got tore up. Every generation got worse and worse and worse. And it's amazing if you think back that the Beatles were able to do what they did in an analog world with four tracks and over and over recording on these various tracks without getting generational loss. In the digital world, if I could get the ones and zeros correct in the correct order that do the audio and video, I don't have a copy. I have a perfect clone. No generational loss. In the early days of my career, I actually worked in digital audio, and we did this experiment with digital audio tape back when we were using tape, and we actually went down 300 generations, and all of the loss attributed to those multi-generational copies came from the electronics. The actual ones and zeros were never at fault if you looked at it on the monitor. So we utilize now within our system, and this is part of our world, 8DCP, High Bandwidth Digital Content Protection. Now it's important for you to recognize that high bandwidth digital content protection isn't associated, you ready for this, with the content. It's associated with the hardware. So there's a couple of ways that I can do it. I could take this PowerPoint presentation and encrypt it with HDCP. All of the hardware must be HDCP enabled 
If it's not, we would not get an image. The manufacturer of the computer has a choice. They can say, trigger HDCP, key authentication and exchange, when the software has it, or, as in the case of some manufacturers, and Apple is probably the one that comes to mind first and foremost, they can simply say, move to a digital world, everything is HDCP, there will be no, the product itself is HDCP, uh, uh, demands HDCP connectivity. So this is actually a pretty neat system that prevents what's called a man in the middle attack, it prevents us from making illicit copies while still allowing us to do some things. It's based on something called Blom's scheme. Now, I want you to imagine this. This fellow Blom, right, he is a cryptologist. He's a mathematician working for, of all places, the CIA. And when he retired, he came to SIMPTI, the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. And they're sitting around in the late 1990s talking about how do we do this because we have this thing called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998. How do we protect this content? And he stood up at the meeting and said, I've got an idea. We could use Blom Scheme, Key Authentication Exchange, and that will work fine. We used it at the CIA. And everybody in the meeting went, that's fantastic. Does it work? He goes, oh, no, it was absolute crap. <laughs> and immediately they went, well, that sounds like it's right for us. <laughs> little question, little trivia question. From the day that HDCP was announced in digital video until the day that the first engineer broke it and said, this isn't going to prevent copying of anything. What was that time period? Anybody want to take a guess? I announced it today. We're going to use Blom Scheme, HDCP. How long before it was broken? Good guess. A day or two? Well, actually, the first paper showing that it was broken came out of the MIT Media Labs. It was 30 days after acceptance as a standard. And then, of course, the industry went, shh, shh, don't tell anybody. Until 90 days later, another scientist working out of UC Berkeley went, no, that guy was right. This thing's not going to work for us at all. But we have it. We get to work with it. It makes me happy because it gives us all kinds of problems to overcome. And everybody needs a mountain to climb, right? So. Thank you for putting that in there. So Blom Scheme is part of this. And by the way, here's what the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, which has been adopted by all of, the all of the countries involved in free trade with the United States. So this is all of North America, all of Europe, most of Asia, right? It says you cannot convert anything with HDCP to any signal that does not have HDCP, whether or not there's illegal copying involved. So, and here's an example, right, not to get off on a, a side, on a side track, but I consulted with an organization not too long ago that back in 2008 did about 130 different huddle rooms, conference rooms, and spaces in a 40-story building. They did analog because they didn't want to spend the money to do HDMI at the time. Now they came back and they have, well, we have five wire RGB HV in each one of these rooms. Can't we do this? I said, you have to run a new wire. This is the best way to do it. Here's how it's going to work. Your integrator is giving you absolutely accurate information. And their in-house guy went online and said, but there's this thing called HD Fury and I can buy it from this distributor out of Taiwan. And it's only $99 a piece. And we're going to order 125 of them and put them in each room. And you know what? It worked perfectly until somebody said, um, do you really want to be known as the company that just violated intellectual copyright standards for the entire world in your corporate business? We can't put that kind of technology into any of our systems. It is forbidden by law. We can actually get into a little bit more information about that. Well, if we're sending digital video, digital audio, and high definition copyright control, we also have to send some control because I'm not going to walk over to the projector. So how do we do control in this? RS-232, bonus round. What does the RS and RS-232 stand for? Anybody? Registered. Close. It was a recommended standard. 1968, the IEEE, which wasn't the IEEE, I can't even remember what they called themselves back then, but they said this is going to be a recommended standard. We've been recommending this for 50 years. All right? So RS-232, wonderful little system, low baud rate, short distance, works well, but it's a nice control system that we use in a lot of things. CEC. CEC is Consumer Electronic Control. This is built into HDMI. Remember back in the first days of consumer HDMI, they had a system that basically said, put the disc in your DVD player, hit the play button, the drawer will close, it'll turn on the audio video receiver, it'll, go to the, it'll turn on the TV, it'll go to the right input, it'll go to the right sound mode, it'll do all of these things automatically, and you tried it and it never worked. That's it. That's the guy right there. 
By the way, it is three generations later. Do not utilize your past experiences to judge this technology. CEC is a rock and solid control system that you can use today. Most commercial product products have CEC in the off position. Most consumer products have it in the on position out of the box. And you can change that in the service menus. Don't be afraid to experiment with it. It works wonderfully in today's age. It allows an individual and devices to control other things. Of course, where would we be without the infrared, what my grandfather called the clicker? Back then it actually made a clicking sound, it was ultrasonic. Um, but the infrared remote control, that's a control. And also USB, and USB is the one that I've spent so much time talking about at Infocom, at Dixie, at AIA meetings, at all of these various locations. USB is the very core of interactivity going forward. And it is so vital that as AV professionals, we become comfortable really understanding and parsing out all of the issues with USB. Wouldn't it be great if we had a system that didn't make us pick which one of these we were going to use? That's a setup, by the way, because we have that. We're going to show it to you in a little bit. So anything that's interactive is USB. We also have to now, because we're sending video and audio, we're sending high bandwidth digital content protection, we're sending control, we better send something that allows the projector to know what's coming down the pipe. And we call that EDID, although technically it's now Display ID, I think version 2.0 is where we're at, but it is a 256 byte system today that really has a tremendous amount of information. It's not just an EDID truth table anymore. There's a huge amount of information talking about sampling rates and bit depths and color capabilities and all of these other things, and we have to get all of that from one point to another. So all of this is the digital payload, right? When we're making AV over 20 meters, it's not AV, it's all five of these things we have to worry about. And we have a number of connection types that we can utilize. I really like this particular uh, quote, given a choice between two theories, take the one which is funnier. It's always worked for me. So our, th our theories are this, we can utilize coaxial cable. Coaxial cable though, right? This is old, antiquated, probably not worth installing. Anybody install coaxial cable on anything lately? Good. HD, HD, well, there you go. We find it in the commercial world. Yeah. Coaxial cable, a piece of RG6, has a thousand times the bandwidth capability of a piece of Category 5. The only real drawback is it's only got one conductor. And because you've been installing it, you're probably aware of this. Do you know how coaxial cable gets that 75 ohm characteristic impedance? It's set by the diameter of the center conductor related to the diameter of the insulation. Doesn't make sense, right? It is a physical manifestation. And here's why cable companies will never ever get a Valentine card from me. Because every time I see them installing coaxial cable, they didn't bring the right crimping tool to put the F connector on. I've seen guys out there squishing it down with a pair of channel locks. Great, that's not 75 ohms. Now my signal's reflecting back to the amplifier somewhere outside of my building. I'm getting delayed, I'm getting crappy signals, and in digital, while I can get a digital signal that looks perfect, it takes away from the power of the digital signal and it's very hard to distribute it. So this is a real issue when we're installing coaxial cable. If you wanna have a good experience, make sure it's not kinked. Make sure we have the right controls. Make sure it stays round and we use the right connectors on the end of it, and if you do, this is absolutely a solid pipeline. And this is why we're using it in HD SDI, 3G SDI, 6G SDI, 12G SDI, and even now 24G SDI. So we're going to have a lot of Gs coming up. We've got 5G cell phones, 24G SDI. I'm waiting for the 40G world, man. I'm, I'm all about that. Let's see what, see what we're going to do. The other way we can make connections is this way, optical fiber. We're seeing a lot of this, but it's a little bit expensive. Right? And in our world, we can utilize two different kinds of optical fiber. We can use a multi-mode fiber and the signal going through that glass. It can bounce around a little bit, but eventually it gets to the far end. There's some really interesting physics going on in there. Almost all of the things that we see generally in an in-premise AV installation are going to be based on multi-mode fiber, generally in OM4, but not all of them. See, the thing about multi-mode is this. The cable is very expensive to manufacture and very expensive to buy. But the connectors on the end, the actual Vixel lasers that drive it, the way it's terminated, those are very inexpensive. 
So we spend a little bit more money on the infrastructure, but we spend a lot less money on the actual physical devices that are driving it. But this is used in a lot of production type facilities. When we look at single mode, we're using a Vixel laser and it's drilling through an eight nanometer center core, allowing us to have extreme lengths, kilometers, kilometers, and almost unheard of bandwidth. Do you know that all of the transatlantic self or transatlantic communications between the United States and Europe can be handled on a single piece of single mode fiber. Of course, there are multiple fibers going to multiple places and there's redundancy and the top of redundancy for security, but in terms of content, it can all go through a single mode fiber. So this really is part of our future. In this case, the cable is much less expensive to manufacture and install but the endpoints are much more expensive. We tend to see this in longer distance networking, and you guys have been a part of that. Of course, the other way that we can make these connections now is twisted pair category cable. Uh, of course, we have category 5E, category 6, category 6A. They're talking about category 8. I truly hope and pray we don't see a lot of category 8 in the AV world. Why, does anybody remember playing with a Category 7? Anybody here was involved in DMC in its earlier generations? That was fun stuff, wasn't it? We don't want to go back to terminating that. But Cat 6A can do some really cool things. We're going to talk about this category cable in a little bit more length. So I'm going to ask you a question. Of course, we're going to be talking about HD base T. What does the base T mean? Anybody wonder about that? Where did we come up with that? Where did the base T come from? Exponents, base 10. Base 10, actually, that's very good. That's very good. It's close. It's not quite there. So it is about transmission. Base, base transmission. And that's exactly what it is, baseband transmission. So when we look at any kind of a network, base T, so we see a base, let's say a, a base 10100, base 101000, right? What we're saying is that is a baseband signal. And a baseband signal, you probably remember this from your analog video days when we use that yellow, red, and white, right? That yellow is a baseband video signal. Basically what it says is it occupies the entire pipe. It goes from the lowest frequencies to the highest frequencies. Nothing else is there. Baseband is the way it operates. So when you see HD base T, you immediately now recognize that it is HD, high definition video, base, baseband T. T means we're sending it over a twisted pair. So if I had an HD base O, or maybe an HD base F, I'm not sure what their nomenclature is, that could be a high definition baseband over fiber. Or an HD base C over coax, if we wanted to go in that way, right? So this is over a twisted pair. Of course, the opposite of a twisted pair, or the opposite of a, a, a baseband is passband. We call this radio. So we're modulating, and we see on the screen here the signal, the sine wave. We're modulating the amplitude of a carrier frequency, and you can see how this follows the sine wave. We take out that carrier frequency, and now we can uh, bring it back. FM, we modulate the carrier frequency itself. The modulation the amplitude stays the same. And once again, you can see that we can recover that signal. These are broadcast methods. All of these are important to what we're going to be talking about in AV. So let's take what we've just discussed and start learning a little bit about life beyond 20 meters. First up, SDI. We've been using this for a while. 1989 it came out, it was doing some really cool stuff, but it really caught on when we got to HD SDI, which gave us the ability to do 480p with great embedded audio capability. And then it really became important in 2006 because at that point in time we started seeing 1080p signal, we had to do production. So now we have 3G SDI, 3 gigabits per second, so now we have the 1080p capability. New standards were released just this year in February by the IEEE, and now we have 6G SDI, which will support 6 gigabits per second over coaxial cable. This is for our 4K at 30 frames per second. We also have a standard for 12G SDI, 12 gigabits per second, and this will support 4K at 60 frames per second at 16-bit color depth with 32 channels of embedded audio. This is a truly powerful way to go. But you know the big problem with SDI? It doesn't do the high bandwidth digital content protection. And therefore, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998 says in black and white that you are forbidden 
from taking a signal from a Blu-ray player, from a laptop computer, from a cell phone, from a streaming device, from anything like that, you are forbidden from taking that signal and running it to this over an SDI link because you will <coughs> violate HDCP. So it's great for house of worship, it's great for production, it's great for post-production, it's great for live event support, but we can't create a huddle room or a conference room with that, yes? Is that a limitation of the cable or that's just the law? Itself? Great question. Is that a limitation of the cable, a limit of the technology, or a limit of our willingness to allow it to be used? And it's the latter. It is an artificial hurdle, but one that's not going to change. So while we can take all the SDI in the world and we can upsample it to HDMI and put it into HDCP and all the analog in the world, once we're in an HDCP environment, once we're on that highway, there are no exits. You must stay on that highway. That's the rules, and that's how we have to design our systems. And by the way, we also have, and this is not proposed, this is real, a 24G SDI that I believe uses eight coaxial cables. I don't know if you've seen it before, but it uses eight coaxial cables to give us 24 gigabits per second, and will support 8K at 60. I have no idea who wants 8K because I, I, I can't do the math in my head to figure out how close I have to be to that screen in order for me to be able to see that resolution. But it is there, and I'm sure that um, somebody in this room will be selling it ne next year if it's available and, and your clients want it, all right? But we're gonna go there. All right, so here's a number of ways that we can get a signal to go from one point to another, and not all of them are the same. And this is the first one that I wanna show you, TMDS twisted pair. TMDS stands for Transition Minimized Differential Signaling. It is the RGB and clock signal of the digital world. I say RGB HV, red, green, blue, horizontal and vertical. If I said RGBS, red, green, blue, and sync. If I said TMDS, in your mind, you should immediately go red, green, blue, sync, digital. That's all that it means, right? Transition minimized differential signaling is an 8B, 10B line coding that was invented by IBM in the 1960s and is actually a pretty cool technology. We cover that in understanding uh, digital formats, a, a course that we did earlier during Infocom's AV months. Now, here's how you can tell this. A lot of products that utilize a TM, what I call a TMDS push technology, they're going to have two category cables. One of them will actually be labeled TMDS and the other one might be labeled hot plug or accessory or plus five volts or whatever we're gonna, and the reason that we do this is we're not making any fundamental difference, any fundamental changes to what's going on in HDMI. You could almost cut the end off an HDMI cable and solder it on to a category cable and end up, you can't really do that. Okay, don't try that, you can't really do that. But that gives you an idea. We're not making any fundamental changes. We're doing a little equalization, we're doing a little jitter correction, um, but we're using two cables. Now some companies have come out with a way of multiplexing in the same way that we did surround sound on vinyl. They've multiplexed some of this information into higher frequencies so they can still do it over a single, ca a single cable. But it is not the same as HD base T, and here's why. This signal relies on the quality of the cable, the quality of the connectors, and the quality of the detectors at the far end. So the important thing about TMDS push technology is the distance of its carriage, the distance at which it can be connected, is inversely proportional proportional to the signal you want to put through it. Let me explain further. We put a projector in this room. I want this to be able to do 720p, because that's good enough for whatever the project's going to be. Great. I put in a TMDS system over a couple of Cat5 cables. It works gloriously. The next person comes in, and they've got a computer. It's 1080p, or we upgrade the projector. It's 1080p. This is very common, by the way, in a K-12 through environment. All of a sudden, it becomes a little bit spotty. Now let's go back. The next teacher that comes in and walks over brings in the computer, but instead of using 420 chroma decimated or chroma truncated, they go to RGB computer graphics because they took photographs on a digital SLR. Maybe it's an art history class. Maybe it's a computer graphics class. Maybe it's a biology class where we're taking these signals. We've all of a sudden increased my payload by double, and while it was working beautifully at 75 feet at 720p, it might have been just a little flaky at 1080p, that same 1080p with different content, now it fails completely. Now you have your school system calling you and going, hey listen, these are unreliable connections. I don't know what's gone wrong. And you blame the manufacturer. 
because we didn't understand that this is a natural limitation to this technology. A lot of manufacturers make them. The advantage of this, we're talking about a couple hundred bucks for a transmit receive pair. So it's very inexpensive, and on a tight bid situation, you will see this installed. But don't confuse it with the newest IEEE standard. This just came about in February of this year, IEEE standardized HD base T. I've been working with HD base T since its uh, inception in 2010, and it is quite a glorious technology. LG Electronics, Samsung, Sony, Valen Semiconductor out of Tel Aviv, all conspired together to really bring us something that's quite amazing, and it is a global standard. The fact that it's an IEEE standard now really does help us out, because it means that you could buy a Legrand transmitter wall plate for HD base T, run through a solid core shielded Cat6, I'll get to that in a minute, to this projector, and if this projector, whether it's a Barco, a Christie, an Epson, if it's got an HD base T RJ45 input, you can plug directly into it. You can use essentially any transmitter with any receiver. That's the way it's supposed to work. We also here understand the realities of the world at large, so if you talk to your Middle Atlantic rep, you talk to your C2G rep, we're going to support you with proof of concept by sending you samples because while it's all supposed to work and play nice in the sandbox, right, we're all been in the AV industry and sometimes that, that's not the, tr the truth in the standard, right? But here's what it does. It allows us to go 100 meters over a single category cable emulating the physical attributes of a LAN connection, we can go that 100 meters and we can do up to eight hops. 100 meters, put in a retransmitter, 100 meters, retransmitter, so forth and so on, up to 800 meters. So it does cover a tremendous amount of space in what it can do. And here's what it's capable of. Once again, these multiple hops, from a media server to a display, to the second display, third display, up to eight displays at 100 meters apiece. HD base T, does support full five play. I kind of like this part about it. It allows us to send digital video and it does support 4K, but it supports 4K at 4.2.0. It does not easily support 4K at 4.4.4. And if you start looking at some of the most sophisticated products in our industry, the matrix and selection switch uh, systems from Crestron, the matrix and selection, selection systems from AMX, these guys are great. They make awesome products. They're using an HD base T backplane, which means they support 4K at 4.2.0. You better have that conversation, especially if you're doing a lot of projects at a university level, or if you're doing projects in the medical environment, or if you're doing projects in the mineral and, and uh, and, and uh, uh, utilities environment, because a lot of times they are using computer generated 4K images, and that is twice the bandwidth and is not supported by HD base T. At this point in time, there is an HD base T solution over fiber called Coligo that does support this, and we'll talk about that. So I have digital video up to 4K, embedded digital audio as part of the digital video signal. One of the things I like about HD base T, and this makes a lot of sense, is it supports 100 megabit per second fast ethernet. Not necessarily the kind of ethernet that I would utilize to send IPTV from point to point, but it's more than fast enough for me to be able to pull a projector for its operational condition. Why is that important? If you're putting a project into a middle school, you bid on an education project or something like that, chances are a middle school built in New Jersey or New York in 1967, no one had the foresight to say, you know what we're gonna need? In 50 years, we're gonna need network drops in the middle of this poured concrete ceiling and you're gonna to struggle to get a single cable up there for a projector, wouldn't it be great if you could extend your network capability by doing that too? And you can, and this can actually be a big difference when we start looking at how we uh, be successful with bids. This can also support power, HD base T power, POH, power over HD base T, is very similar to POE, can provide up to 100 watts. What I love about this is, the thinking is, it's enough power to support a 55 inch flat panel. So if I wanted to put a 55 inch flat panel on this wall, and I don't have an AC outlet up here, I can utilize a single category cable, and it will be enough to send the signal, it'll be enough to send the control, and it'll be enough to send the power, so I can literally hang a flat panel just like it was a picture. Is that available today? Actually it is. But in a strange twist of marketing fate, buying a TV without a power supply is significantly more expensive than buying a TV with a power supply. But I think we're going to see the market catching up with that. But we're going to see a lot of interesting things here. And by the way, this also supports control. 
HD based T supports CEC, it supports infrared, it supports RS-232, and it supports USB up to 2.0 speeds simultaneously. You don't have to pick, so you get to do it. Remember that image I showed you a little bit earlier about an eye pattern in digital video? This is why HD based T is such a miracle. That is the eye pattern for HD based T. It took me an awful lot of work to be able to get this because this is deep, deep, deep inside of the technology. It's very hard to capture. And I've always had this question as an engineer. I called the guys at Valens. I talked to these guys many times and I said, okay, listen, I understand. A category cable is rated at a certain speed, 250 megahertz, 100 megahertz, whatever. And you're telling me I can do 1080p over this, which I know can be up to 10 gigabits per second, 10 megabits. It really does sound, guys, like you're telling me you can put a gallon in a quart bucket and I'm not believing it. And they finally said, well, no, it's the technology. Said, Prove it to me. And I sat down with some engineers and they had to talk very, very slow. But they finally got across to me what's happening here is something called Pulse Amplitude Modulation 16, where we're using 16 levels. We're using all four of those cables to make one cable where each of the channels has 16 levels to give us a 64-bit throughput. It's really a fantastic slate of hand. It's very similar to what we're using right now to get to 10 gig networking where we're using PAM4. So this is a very sophisticated signal that's happening indeed. There are other ways that we can extend beyond HD base T. And by the way, that last signal, if I can go backwards here, this is why we highly recommend if you're utilizing HD base T, First of all, you should look for an HD base T org certified cable. Did you know they had those? It's not just name brands, right? Crestron has cables for their things and, and, and Extron has cables for their things. And they're, they're wonderful cables because they're utilizing HD Base T org certification. In HD Base T, they are actually now certifying cables. At Legrand, we have them. Superior Essex has them. Belden has them. A number of companies have them. And what they're saying is this this cable is designed for this level of bandwidth. And more importantly, HD Base T is incredibly unhappy if we have external noise getting into this system. So we want to use a shielded cable or we could use a non-continuous shield, a brand new technology that's also been certified by HD Base T. And you can get them from a, a lot of different locations and we can talk about that at the end of this webinar. Other methods that we can utilize to extend digital video beyond 100 or up to 100 meters and beyond, we can do media conversion. In this case, we're going to true fiber. I can go kilometers at this point in time. Um, we can also convert this to a coaxial link. So we're going to convert it to SDI. Now this is not the same as the SDI we're using in the commercial world. It's proprietary and it does keep alive the HDCP link. So you can utilize coaxial cables to do extensions oftentimes up to about 300 meters. And of course we can do uh, integrated media conversion. So this would be a product like uh, a celerity cable, a rapid run optical, where we're actually taking an HDMI signal, converting it from electrons to photons, and now we can move with 22 gigabits per second per channel, a 444 4K signal up to 300 meters. So have that conversation with your clients. What are you doing in your room? What's the content? Who's using it? What do you expect it to evolve into? And if you find out that a client is going to need RGB 4K, and many of them will, you now have the ability to sit back and say, all of the other folks that are bidding on this contract or are looking at this project or are designing for you, they haven't asked this question because they don't understand that their systems are liable to fail as we scale them in the future. So we do have signals coming over fiber optic that will allow you to carry that. The other way that we can do it is this. And in fact, I did a project like this not long ago in a, a building where we had to get high definition video into a series of elevators. Not an easy thing to do. If you've ever worked in an elevator company, you don't tell them the wire that you want run. They tell you the wire that you can use. We had 1,700 feet of RG6. And they wanted 1080p in every elevator car. What did we do? We created, a, we created a cable company in their building. We basically created a cable company. We put in, I think at that point, about 400 uh, digital signage flat panels, including the elevator cars, and we simply did everything over coax and created a system. In this case, it was not an HDCP system um, because there were some challenges there with HDC, HDCP. Now, you may also be asking yourself, what about IPTV? This is the best thing in the world. My God, they're streaming stuff from Netflix. God only knows where they are to my house over IPTV, and it works beautifully. You know what the problem with IPTV is? It hits the network. 
and there's never been a network director who has said to you, ah, go ahead, you can put more stuff on there. We have the biggest pipes in the world. No problems with capacity, no problems with security. Feel free to create all the virtual networks on our land that you'd like, they right? Down or like no, no, and, it, and they're definitely not gonna control the quality of service and throttle that thing down. I was actually at a location last week doing a presentation and I carry network analysis software on my computer to see the speed. It's a pretty cool part of Windows 10, little tool that they have. And I had 0.25 megabits per second download speeds, but I had 20 megabits per second upload speeds. Tell me that IT director wasn't throttling things back a little bit. Email was all you could do, but I uploaded a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so it was very, very cool. IPTV goes on the network. Yes, it's wonderful and you can use it in your house, but here's the one drawback and it's not a bad technology and it's one that you should consider, but I want you to think about this. If it's IPTV, it means there's a full blown computer in this projector with all the issues that go along with that from security, from dependability, from cost, and from complexity. So IPTV is a great system. And by the way, at Legrand, we are also into IPTV through our Raritan division. So we make all of these solutions, and I'm not telling you one is better than the other. I'm telling you, as in everything else, all of these tools have their place in your toolbox, and you want to understand how to use them. So here's our conclusion. I'm getting pretty close to the end of time, the place where we got tired of thinking. If we have a digital video application, a lot of thought has to be put into any run more than 15 to 20 meters in length. We have to ask, is it going to be 444 video? How is the audio going to be handled? Is there going to be HDCP? What kind of capabilities do we have to run the wires? What's the scalability in the future? Not just a budget issue. When we start thinking about digital video content, it's all about analog signals inside that wire or fiber. So we can't take off our analog hats. And I keep telling my wife, this makes me so happy because a guy like me that's been doing this for 30 years, I'm still in style. I'm an analog dude and I can still talk about the analog. When I went to engineering school, we actually did have, I'm not making this up, we had to learn how to use slide rules. I don't think I could remember how to use it, but all of those analog things that I thought I learned, and even the vacuum tube, my, I'm gonna retire, I'm gonna build, the gold vacuum tube amplifiers, by the way. But all that vacuum tube stuff we learned, it's still germane. So that's pretty cool stuff. When we talk about digital video, understand the payload. It's video, it's audio, it's HDCP, it's EDID information, it can even be power. We can't move to SDI, although it is wonderfully elegant because it doesn't support HDCP. But HD base T, that really is kind of at the core of this. A while ago, I asked you a question, or I gave you an answer, and the answer was two. Anybody want to take a guess on the question? I'll save you some time. Two Red Bulls is how many you need to drink to get this excited about digital wire. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that out there. Do we have any questions from the room or from our webinar participants? Yes? Now, what, what kind of technology, I don't know if you if you're familiar with like HD over coax systems mm -hmm. such as ZV, what kind of technology is going to that? I can't speak on ZV precisely what they're doing. And there's another one, Lynx, where they're doing some HD technology over a cat over twisted pair that is not um, uh, necessarily that. I bring that up because it's HDCP content, a good majority of the time. It is HDCP content. They're doing some interesting proprietary connectivity that's allowing them. Once again, we have more than enough bandwidth over coaxial cable, but I don't have specific information about how they're doing it. But you know what? You just gave me an idea for a whole new training seminar. Now I get to go and dig and mine and ask some questions. And even more importantly, I'm gonna go buy some samples because I like stuff. So why wouldn't I? Other questions? Great question, thank you. Yes? Do those fiber solutions uh, support 444? Yes, many of the fiber solutions, right? So for instance, rapid run optical, celerity, these kind of fiber solutions that we sell, they are 444 compliant. Uh, HD base T's Coligo chip, which is really just coming online, it's a little expensive, that supports 444 because we have the bandwidth in the link. The real problem comes down to when I'm creating a matrix switch, when I'm creating something with a backplane, having that kind of bandwidth on those electronics, all of a sudden the price, if, if you think the price is expensive now, it would go through the roof when we start being able to switch 8K or 4K, 444 with an alpha channel, 32-bit video. So there are solutions but I think now the most important part is we're armed with the question to find out do we need to move into those solutions to avoid future, program, uh, future problems. Yeah, most of the fiber solutions will support a 444 bandwidth simply because in fiber we have so much more bandwidth than we do in copper. 
Any questions from our folks online, Kaylee? I want to thank everybody this morning for this. We're going to be back with another training in a little bit. I think we have a 15-minute break right now. Thank you very much. Let's reconvene here in about 15 minutes.